do that before I, before I forget. Um, that uh, everybody on the wait list um, should be able to get enrolled by the end of the week. It's it's looking pretty good. Um, if you are in, if you're on the wait list for both lab sections, please unenroll from from the one you don't want, so we know where we have to shuffle people around. Um, but yeah, we should get that handled. I ran into some issues trying to get everybody added that's on the wait list to the Canvas shell. Um, but if you, so if you've been on the wait list and I told you to watch for an email about getting added, um, we weren't able to get that done. So you'll just be a little bit behind when it comes to submitting the um, assignments. Um, but don't worry, I'm not gonna take off points if you're on the wait list and couldn't submit while you were waiting to get the registration taken care of. So um, I think we're looking pretty good on that front. Um, so we're gonna get into talking about conversions day a little bit, but first we'll talk about the quiz um, just because I like to get to know you guys and, and everybody did, uh, unsurprisingly, there were a lot of 10 out of 10s on the scores for this one, right? There are no wrong answers. This is my favorite type of quiz. Um, although always, I'm never able to give everybody a 10 out of 10 because somebody answered the last question I don't really have any questions right now, which I specifically said, don't do that. I won't give you full credit. So there's a nine out of 10, at least one of those out there. And I haven't given everybody their scores yet um, just because I try to take my time and go through them and read everything. Um, so I only got through the first half of them now. So if you ask the question about the class and we don't talk about it today, um, rest assured we will we'll talk about it on Thursday once I get a chance to finish reading the rest of those. And it turns out that reading um, 50 people's questions and answers about all, you know, their favorite music and that kind of stuff. It does take a little bit of time. So um, we'll finish though. I will finish reading those um, and uh, answer all relevant questions, especially um, a lot of times I'll just reply with in class just means that um, I'm not going to write a detailed response here because I thought it was a good question and we'll talk about it in class. If not, you know, now, then sometime soon I keep a list um, in my Dropbox of, of good quiz questions. So um, if I say just write in class, I'm just trying to save time. Don't be, don't be offended. It doesn't mean I won't get to it. Um, just means I didn't want to take the time to answer it yet. Uh, other than that, so we will do a little bit more practice with sig figs, but I, I'm pretty good with where we finished up last week. Um, I did not get the video posted for that. I'm going to do that over the break um, just right now, or not right now, in 50 minutes or whenever we take our break. Um, just my schedule at the end of last week was all funky, so I got out of my rhythm and forgot to post that link. So I'll get that done. Um, but a side note, if I ever forget to post the link, a lot of times the video still gets put on YouTube. So from, from any of the other video links, um, you can usually get to whatever my latest posted videos are, which is going to be mixture of videos from this class and from way um, and from um, my OCHEM class. So just ignore the ones that say CHEM 2, 223, because that's not you yet. Um, and But you should be able to get to whatever the most recent videos are that way if I've forgotten to upload, to um, update that the canvas shell. So anytime you're looking for that, you can get there from something like this. Jeez. Oh, okay, maybe we won't show you right now. Hang on, because I never get these texts right away. Hey, it actually worked today. Um, so from from this channel, if you just click on on my user whatever profile channel whatever they call it, and just click through till you get to the list of things that I've uploaded, you can find whatever the most recent lecture is that way. Um, if the link hasn't updated yet, so. Apologies if you went back and tried to rewatch that over the weekend. It wasn't there yet. Um, random quiz questions. Um, 
people were interested in how I feel about being at LTCC, which is a new category of questions. Nobody's ever asked these before. Uh, and two people asked me about what it's like to work here. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, I don't plan on leaving anytime soon. Um, I have two kids in Bijou at the Immer Spanish Immersion Program, and you're not supposed to, uh, they're supposed to stay there through fifth grade. Um, so, and my youngest, I guess my current youngest is in kindergarten right now. Um, and my youngest, youngest will be born in September. So I'll be here for a bit longer, at least. Um, so, um, and it's actually, frankly, the Bijou is one of the coolest things about working here is that my kids get to go to Bijou, which is a lot of fun. I get to relearn some of my Spanish. They get some good skills that way. Um, and it's, it's a pretty cool place to live. I like living in South Lake Tahoe. Um, somebody asked me, do I think aliens exist? Um, I'll give the same answer that I gave my, gave my son when he was feeling really, really nervous about whether or not aliens existed. Um, I don't remember what movie we watched. We watched something that had him worried about aliens. Um, Pacific Rim, I think it was. It used to be his favorite movie. Um, and the biggest answer is space is really, really, really big. There's a lot of stars and a lot of stuff in space, but there's also a lot of just empty space. Um, odds are there is other life in in the universe, but the odds are also that by the time any signal sent by another civilization got to us, let alone an actual spaceship, um, our planet will be, you know, devoid of intelligent life, if not totally just destroyed. Um, so yeah, it's, it's more along the lines of um, the odds are that, uh, you know, we're not all that long lived. Life, you know, intelligent life is not typically all that long lived to the best of our knowledge, especially not when you're talking about galactic time scales, um, which are, you know, a hundred to a hundred to a million times longer than geological time scales, which are already like a million times longer than a civilization's time scale. So um, likely, but do I know if we'll ever actually have any evidence of that? Probably not. It's more of just a uh, playing the odds sort of answer there. Um, what do I like the most? I get to answer fun questions like this and hang out with you guys. I get captive audience that has to listen to me talk about science for however many hours a week I can convince people to sit in the classroom with me. Um, for which my, my wife and my kids greatly thank you because otherwise they'd be my captive audience um, and they'd get really tired of that. So uh, uh, it sounds cliche, but really students, I really like um, showing everybody that chemistry doesn't have to be scary. Yes, it's a lot of work like any field of study, but it doesn't have to be anything that's any trickier than business or biology or art. In fact, in a lot of ways, it's more clear cut than art because there are right answers in chemistry um, as opposed to art. And then what are my recommendations? Somebody asked me to answer my own quiz questions. Um, so I listen to a lot of everything. Um, so I just threw some Spotify playlists that I have going um, for my music answers. Um, I you know, started with classic rock and kind of went in all sorts of different varieties from there. I really like Delta Blues, early, early 30s Delta Blues is a favorite of mine, but I also like modern death metal and, and black metal and metalcore and hip hop and R&B and sort of everything. That's why I asked you guys for ideas because I'm always looking for what's the newest subgenre that I haven't heard of before. I do. I like Aesop Rock. Aesop Rock has been on my on my playlist for a long time since I was in college and since Labor Days came out, um, which I'm dating myself now. But yeah, Ace is great. He's still. You guys know he plays up here occasionally, like random, no no announcement shows. He played a show at Whiskey Dicks, um, like during the pandemic. He just like. <laughs> um so keep an eye apparently whiskey dicks is they do death metal and they do you know bay area hip-hop apparently and actually afro man i think played there once um which is a throwback and the because i got high song that was <laughs> big when i was in high school um anyway beside the point movies i like a lot of stuff um i like i like artsy stuff i like 
you know, pretentious. If anything could be accused of being pretentious in the movie or music realm, I'd probably really like it. Um, like, you know, David Lynch type stuff, but I really like um, Interstellar and Annihilation. In fact, I will continue to reference Interstellar because I think it has the best description of chemistry in any pop culture I've ever seen. It's their, the um, explanation of Murphy's Law. It's not whatever can go wrong, will go wrong. Um, the definition they use in Interstellar is whatever can happen does happen, and that's chemistry. Chemistry is law of probabilities and averages, and everything happens in small amounts. And sometimes it's just about playing those averages and the statistics. Um, so we'll co come back and keep talking about ideas like that. And if you haven't seen Annihilation with Oscar Isaacs and uh, is it Natalie Portman, I think, yeah. um, that's a fantastic, trippy sci-fi movie. It's a really, um, really a lot of fun. And if you really want to feel like you're losing your mind, you should read the book because it it's really hard to follow what's happening sometimes. And I was never quite sure, I was reading it before bed, I was never quite sure if I was just really, really tired and like drifting in and out of consciousness or if it was the book. Turns out it's the book. Um, it's, a, it's really, really cool. It's a whole trilogy and it gets easier to follow as you get into it more. Um, but I, like, I also like a lot of hard sci-fi, meaning like sci-fi where the science is actually plausible. It's not like, you know, not Star Wars type sci-fi, nothing against Star Wars, but it's not, not what uh, I typically read. Um, Kim Stanley Robinson is one of my favorites. He's, uh, he's an author who lives in a housing co-op in Davis actually. Um, and he's, uh, he wrote one of, he wrote a trilogy of books about Mars, about terraforming Mars, where he gets all of everything from the geology to the chemistry, to the time scale of transporting materials from earth to Mars. Um, he, you know, nails the science on it and does it in a really compelling, fun read way. Um, so I highly recommend his stuff as well. And then my interest in other books are pretty much as, as widely varied as my music tastes. So I'm all over the place. Um, lately I've been reading a fair number of, of, uh, comic book series. Good. Again, anything that could be accused of being pretentious, I probably really like it. Um, just because I like that high concept type stuff. So if you're looking for ideas for what to read next, um, let me know. I probably have read something that you've read in the past or um, have some suggestions. Questions that are more related to chemistry. Um, is it necessary to have a good understanding of chemistry to be a good cook or chef? No, but it does help sometimes especially if you're trying to do new things and push boundaries. If you're just kind of like playing around in some of the concepts that have already been, been established in terms of cooking. Um, and and uh, it's, it's the verb of being a chef. Um, you know, there's, I guess, chefing. Um, that if you want to actually push the boundaries, then uh, uh, understanding chemistry does help. There's some really cool stuff that, you know, the term that gets thrown around is molecular gastronomy is when they use like lab techniques to kind of in make food that's different. Um, so like, but sometimes there's some even more interesting things that happens when you look at molecular structures of things that trigger your taste buds and your, your smell receptors. Um, you can actually get some really, really interesting combinations that would are not found culturally. They're not found like historically because they're ingredients that are, grow on different sides of the planet. Um, you know, stuff like coffee crusted salmon um, sounds really, really weird, but you can actually look at some of the, the things you would normally use to make a crusted salmon dish and say, well, they have similar flavor profiles, similar molecular structures to some of the flavor compounds that are in coffee. So what happens if we put coffee on salmon? Um, and you actually, you know, you can find some really weird combinations that are surprisingly cohesive. They don't taste like you just threw random stuff in a blender or something like that. Um, so there's some really cool movements within science and, and, um, and biology, and especially um, when it comes to cooking, which is kind of cool. There's a really good book called Molecules and T Taste Buds um, that goes into that and has like a bunch of these sort of really random recipes that you can try. If you don't believe me, it's a, it's a pretty cool book. Um, why is smoke sometimes white or black? Who knows what smoke is? 
Why does why do some fires smoke and others don't? Water content. Water content has something to do with it, but water content can be steam. It's not usually the what we consider smoke, but water high water content makes wood smoke more when it burns, but usually because it lowers the temperature the wood is burning, which means you don't get as much complete combustion. The wood burns, but it doesn't burn as well. So smoke is actually tiny particles of unburnt fuel. Um, and if you change the size of those particles, you get different colors of smoke. The, um, and if you depend on what the type of wood is, et cetera, but water content plays a role in that because water, high water content keeps the temperature of the fire down lower, which is why it's harder to start a fire with wet wood and why wet wood smokes more. Um, so it really has to do with the temperature of the fire and, and you know, how much oxygen is, how hot it's burning, what the conditions are, is gonna determine what the smoke quality is like, um, which is kind of cool. Um, I, off the top of my head, I don't know whether hot would burn more black versus white, um, but generally the smaller particles you make, um, the more they scatter light and the more they look white. So my guess is that white smoke is more small particles and the larger your particles get of the unburnt fuel, the more you get more like ashy black soot smoke. Um, but that's just me going shooting from the hip there. So I don't know that for sure. Um, I'll look into it more though when I have more time. This one's on here because this is a pet peeve of mine. There is absolutely zero difference between natural chemicals and synthetic chemicals. Um, if we're talking about the same chemical, the same molecule made if it's made naturally versus made in the lab has absolutely zero difference as far as your body is concerned, as far as properties are concerned. Um, when you see things like organic or um, natural in terms of ingredients, Sometimes that can mean it came, came from natural sources, but sometimes it just means that it, it's a compound that occurs in nature, not necessarily that it was made in nature for this particular sample. So you can have synthetic natural compounds. A synthetic natural compound means it was made in a lab, but it's a compound that occurs naturally. And there should be no difference between whether, you know, in terms of taste, in terms of health, et cetera. Um, where it came from. Um, on the other hand, all that you need to do to have um, food labeled as organic. So this is a, a separate, almost a whole separate pet peeve, but it has to do with the mislabeling of, of, um, of or misuse of scientific terms. Um, organic produce just means that it was only treated with pesticides that are, occur in nature. So that not that there were no pesticides used, just that the pesticides used show up somewhere else. And there's a lot of really, really nasty, deadly stuff that occurs in nature, right? Arsenic is technically an organic pesticide. Um, it's not something you really want to ingest, right? So there are actually some times when it's actually worse for your own health to eat organic produce than non-organic produce because organic pesticides also typically are less effective, so they have to use more of them. Um, in particular, uh, copper gets used as a fungicide a lot in organic um, produce, and copper is neurotoxic. It bioaccumulates over, over a long period of time. It'll tend to accumulate in your brain and cause problems long-term, um, but it's an organic pesticide, so it's totally safe to use, but it's not a very good one, so they have to slather it on the crops. So there's a ton of it when it, when these crops get to, to market. So organic is not necessarily mean healthier to eat or even better for the environment, because if they have to use more of these pesticides, that means more pesticides that are being washed into streams and more runoff problems. So, you know, it means that there's not one silver bullet in terms of all you have to do is pay attention to this term and you'll be able to be healthy and more environmentally conscious. You actually have to pay more attention and make conscious decisions, which is a pain um, and requires uh, a lot more of your attention 
than just saying, well, this was the organic section, I can buy it and I'm being good, you know, doing something good for myself and the environment. So more on that as we get more into chemistry. Um, we'll leave, there's one more thing, we'll, we'll do the, do people have different taste buds since we already took, talked about cooking, we'll save the other two for Thursday, Wednesday. Um, people, as far as I know, don't have different taste, I guess, I guess I can't say that. Um, some people do actually genetically have different taste buds. Um, there are some genetic mutations that happen that the primary way we know that they've even happened is because to some people, things like cilantro, um, it's not just that they don't like cilantro, they actually have genetic mutation that makes cilantro taste like soap. Literally, they, they, they get sick when they eat cilantro. Um, and ju not just a taste thing. So there are actually physical differences between people sometimes as far as what things they like and don't like. Um, but beyond things like that, there's also, there's really only three tastes that we're hardwired to always want. Um, people, humans in general, evolved, taste evolved as a way of, of differentiating between what was gonna be good for us and bad for us when we were hunter gatherers. Um, and when we were hunter gatherers, there was never any guarantee that you were gonna get a certain resource ever again. Um, and so we actually have a genetic predisposition. Everybody has a genetic predisposition to want things that would be really, really rare if you were a hunter gatherer. And those things, that's sweet, salty, fatty. Those three things, we are, everybody is hardwired to want those three tastes, to think those taste good, because those are the things that we needed, but would be hard to find if we weren't farming, if we weren't an agricultural society. Um, so now that we're an agricultural society, those things we, are things we think of as being, tasting really good, but being bad for us, right? Because now we can have as much of them as we want. Um, so it's really just a case of our tastes have not caught up to what's good for us yet based on the way that, that our society is these days. Um, anything beyond those three tastes though, salty, sweet, fatty, um, is learned. So it's cultural, it comes from what you grew up with, it comes from associating a positive experience in the past with a certain flavor. Um, and that's all learned. So, you know, it's, it's why your taste changes over time as well, as you had more positive experiences with certain flavors, you're gonna start liking those flavors more. Um, so it's just, that's kind of a fun one to end on for random topics. Um, and think about that too. Next time you, you eat your favorite comfort food that you grew up with, it's, it's gonna be salty, sweet, fatty, with some other spices or other flavors in there that are going to be indicative of where you grew up, how you grew up, you, those past experiences you have. All right, these are the ones that I really want to make sure I answer thoroughly because these are the, the questions relevant to the course. How do I best succeed in this class? What would I say are the best shared traits of most successful students I have had? Um, and I'll tie that into, I'm not that strong at math yet. Um, is this a class that I'm going to have issues with? Well, I can't predict the future, but you don't have to be a math major to do well in this class. Being good at the math means that that's one less thing you have to focus on and be trying to learn at the same time. Um, so it's an advantage, certainly, to already be good at algebra to be able to be, you know, do that math review with your eyes shut. Um, sure, of course, that's gonna be helpful if you already know some of the material. But if you can do this stuff on the math review, we're that's as complicated as it gets and we're gonna keep adding and practicing um, those concepts as we go. So it's not something that's, um, it's impossible to get an A if, you, if you're not confident, if you're not already, you know, good at math. That's not how this course works. It might feel like that sometimes, um, but I'll try not to make it overwhelming. Um, and that goes along with the, the top two. How can you best seeds? Keep coming, keep working, keep asking questions. Everybody in here has already done 
at least part one of those, right? Keep showing up. Um, the other thing is if you do get behind, it can start to feel overwhelming. There's a lot of assignments in this class, right? Um, I still take late work, including the quizzes. So turn your stuff in as fast as you can. Um, and if you get like weeks behind, you're still not out of the game yet, right? I would generally suggest that you don't try to do all your catch up work chronologically because then everything's gonna be late, almost like a clean break. Okay, everything from here on is on time and I'm still trying to fill in those gaps for the assignments I didn't finish yet. Um, might be the, the way to do it in terms of make, maximizing your points. Um, but really getting stuff in on time, showing up to class, and then trust me when I try to tell you what's going to be on the test, right? This class, because we move so fast, we only have the one test, um, but it's not gonna be a surprise what's on that test. The, pre the your last assignment is a practice test. And your practice test is the year before his final exam. Right, so it's really, really straightforward in terms of I'm not going to try and spring something unexpected when it comes to a test, right? Don't try to overanalyze this and say, I think he's going to try and change that, or I'm going to study this over here, even though it's not on the practice test. I'm not trying to trick you with this. This is going to be so that you have an exact list of these are the most important topics, according to Sean, and what he's going to test us on. So listen to me when I try to tell you things like that. Don't, and you should be fine. We'll get, if you're not good at taking tests yet, we'll get you more comfortable with it, right? And, you know, talk to the DRC. Or I think we're, it's the Student Accommodation Services now, SAS. Um, if you need accommodations for tests as well, we'll get you to the point where you're feeling better about your tests. If you can do those things, show up, take me at my word and listen when I try to tell you what's going to be on the test, you're going to be fine. You can do real well in this class. Was there a question over here a second ago? Did I see a hand? All right. All right. If you missed a lab one week, can you make it up on the other week or on the other lab section? Um, check with me ahead of time because it's going to depend on lab capacity. It depends on who's there that week. It depends on um, what we're doing this week. Um, it's not too much of an issue because we're not dealing with anything dangerous, really. Um, some weeks, I'm going to be more strict about that, and that's kind of going to be on a case-by-case -case basis, right? So try to not do that, but if you do have to for whatever reason, let me know ahead of time, and we'll talk about it. We'll work out something that'll work. And last but not least, will we be seeing any fire this quarter in our labs? I like that question. Um, it gets to the heart of why I chose a chemistry major in high school. I liked setting stuff on fire. I was that student that couldn't be left alone in the lab because I'd find something to light on fire. Um, we will not be dealing with fire that much because we don't have any gas hookups out there. There will be some labs that we do some things where we can light stuff on fire, um, but it won't. we won't even be using Bunsen burners. We'll be using hot plates in their, in their place because we don't have the, the natural gas lines out there. That said, there will still be some fun stuff. We'll do some flame tests, the you know, dissolve copper ions in something that burns, and then you set it on fire and it burns green, or you can make stuff burn purple. Um, we'll do some some cool stuff like that. Um, but there won't be that much fire, hopefully. Always have to qualify that, right? There will be as much fire as you all start, um, which is hopefully minimal. Any other course questions? Anything I brought up that uh, raises the question you thought? Yeah. Curious question. What's the most dangerous compound? It depends on what lab you're in. Okay. It depends on what else is going on around. And do you mean like, like dangerous for your reproductive health, or do you mean dangerous like you're going to get third degree burns? Third degree burns. So. Um, uh, well, we have we have some potassium metal that uh, reacts so violently with the moisture in the air. If you take a piece of uh, on a humid day, if you take a piece of potassium metal and you set it on a, on a um, glass plate, uh, it'll spontaneously combust just from reacting with the moisture in the air. Um, so that's a pretty fun one. We'll actually do a demo where I take a piece of it and 
throw it in water on purpose and it pops like a firework um, and it burns it burns like pinkish purple so you get like this pinkish purple sort of firework look um, if you notice any like burn marks on the inside of the fume hood that's from doing that experiment because it does that um, that's what the fume hood's there for um, but then there's also the like I got a drop of it on my wrist above my glove and two weeks later I'm dead level of chemicals. We don't have many of those, but they do exist. Organo, organomercury compounds are absorbed into your, um, through the cell membranes of your skin very, very easily. And even a, if not a student, um, someone with a PhD in toxicology research um, got a drop of, I wanna say it was dimethylmercury on her, on her wrist um a few years ago and didn't even realize it at the time and two weeks later she was dead um so there are some really nasty stuff out there we try to avoid that as much as possible though remind me your name preston, preston. um when, when a drop of that gets into your skin is it actually like any way like a solid or is it like, they, if they had been able to catch it earlier, they probably could have treated it. It's basically heavy metal poisoning. The problem is that it, if it's metallic mercury, your body's pretty good at just like, passing it through. You know, you can eat metallic mercury and your body just passes it through the digestive system. But when it's got, when it's mercury that's attached to um, carbon-based compounds, your body's not able to differentiate it as well. And it gets incorporated into proteins and mercury specifically accumulates really quickly in a certain part of the brain, um, which is it's one of those um, trivia facts that I've known forever. So I don't know if everybody else knows. That's actually where the phrase mad as a hatter comes from. The mad hatter in Alice in Wonderland is because the, the people that made hats, which I think are sell hats, you're a milliner, but if you make hats, you're a hatter. Um, in uh, London, they used to use liquid mercury to crease in, in place of using starch to crease the brims of the hats. Um, and they would, wet, they would wet their fingers in their mouth, grab some mercury, spread it around the outside of the hat, and then put it down and do the next one. And so they're constantly putting mercury into their mouth, um, which is why most people that were hatters at that time eventually died of mercury poisoning, but not before they went mad. Um, so that's actually where that character comes from in Alice in Wonderland. Um, and in, in the case of organic mercury, it happened way faster. They probably could have treated it with some chelation or something um, had they known about it in time. But I think by the time they realized what had happened, it was too far gone. Um, but I don't know. Organic mercury is also really hard to treat because it's not like regular heavy metal poisoning either once it gets associated with those carbons. All right, let's review a little bit. Um, and we'll notice this is kind of, I'm actually, like I said, I'm pretty happy with where we ended up at the end by last week, um, but pretty commonly we'll spend the first half of class reviewing stuff, talking about quiz questions, going over the quiz questions when they're more specific. Um, so now would also be a good time to ask about anything from the math review you wanted to go over in more detail. Um, and then after break, we introduce more new material so you'll see it sort of twice broken up in different lectures once is new material once is review for everything so just because it's 35 minutes after we're just getting to this stuff doesn't it's kind of how this class is designed anyway so all right let's do another practice with this is not the version that i thought it was it must not have updated uh let's do practice this these are going to be the practice problems anyway so Let's look at these for our practice problems for order of operation or for sig figs and uncertainty. And as this practice test shows, this is going to be 10% of your final exam. There's going to be four questions like this, right? Not trying to hide that. Instead, there's going to be a multiplication or division. There's going to be an addition, subtraction, and there's going to be a couple that mix and match. What's our rule for number one? How do we know where we're going to wind up rounding? Uh, 
I heard some numbers and I heard a few people, the smaller number of sig figs. So because it's division, multiplication division, we keep the same number of sig figs as our least certain number. So we've got five sig figs on top, three sig figs on bottom. So we're gonna keep three sig figs when we're done, which gives us the final answer of 4.70. What happens to the units for that? We keep both of them. We treat units like they're variables, which means if we're adding them, then our units stay the same, just like 3x plus 4x. It's now 7x once you add them. But when we're doing multiplication or division with variables, if it's on the same on top and bottom, we can cancel it out. Otherwise, we just leave it the way it is. So 4.70 grams over milliliters, grams per milliliter. And I'm gonna, this is one of those things I'm going to hammer it in through repetition until you can't possibly mess this up. Um, does anybody know what per means? We'd say this, if we're writing, if we're reading out these units, you'd say grams per milliliter, right? What does per mean? For each one, per each one. That's per means for every. And that'll come into play a lot when we start talking about unit conversions later today. But yeah, anytime, if you have 4.70 grams per milliliter, it means for that substance, every one milliliter is 4.70 grams. So think miles per hour, right? For every hour, you go this distance. And so this is what an example of what I call combined units, or we talked a little bit about it before, derived units, where it comes from other fundamental units being put together. Um, and it winds up being really important in terms of, of unit conversions, especially. How about, so the numbering looks weird here, but let's do number three next. That's the other simple one. What's the rule? for addition and subtraction. We keep the least certain number does what? Uh, determines, uh, determines our safety. Yeah. It's one of those things where the where if I get really specific about the language, it's hard to say the way it doesn't sound really funky. Yeah, our least certain number or our number with the most uncertainty determines where we're going to round. Right, so which of those two numbers has has the larger uncertainty? Minute. Well, they're both minutes. I mean, one hundred and forty-five. One forty-five. Yeah. Where's the uncertainty in one forty-five? In the ones place. Right. So one forty-five plus or minus one minute, and one point two five plus or minus point oh one minutes. So our larger uncertainty is plus or minus one minute. So when we add everything up, we need to keep it. Our last written digit, our last reported digit is going to be in the ones place. So 146 minutes. The way that I kind of, it might not help you remember which is which, but the way that I remember the two rules is there's, there's the rule that's easier and there's the rule that makes sense. This one's more of a pain, especially if scientific notation is involved, but it's the one that fundamentally makes sense. That's your friend calling from Placerville, the stoplight, right? Um, when you just think about it in terms of uncertainty, the addition subtraction rule is really easy to follow the concepts. It's a little bit harder in practice when we're dealing with adding really big numbers together. This one's easier to take into account when we're dealing with really big numbers. So I remember them as the one that makes sense and the easy one. And it just takes practice. We'll just keep going with it um, and you'll get more and more comfortable with it. What do we do with this one?
which rule or rules do we need to use? Order of operations. So we have multiplication and we have division. Is that two different rules when it comes to sig figs? Those are the same category of rules, right? They both are gonna follow, count your sig figs, keep your same number of sig figs. So we've got four sig figs on the 0.5455 liters, four sig figs on 1.000 liters, three sig figs on 12.1. So we keep three sig figs. We get something like 6.3. 6.6. Yeah. And what do we do with our units? So remember that when we're doing multiplying with fractions, we just multiply across, right? And if something's written, if it's not written as a fraction, that 0.5455 liters is really just over one, right? And that one doesn't have a unit, that's just sort of a placeholder. So when we're multiplying this across, it doesn't really matter if you know what a mole is at this point, it's just a unit. It's all that matters, we'll talk about what it means later. So when we do the math here, our units we multiply across and we get liters times moles on top and over liters on bottom. So what do we do with that? Cross out liters, bingo. So despite the fact you don't know what it is, or maybe you do, but we haven't defined it yet, we've, we're just left with 6.60 moles. That's all we really need to answer this question. I realize it's not very satisfying when I just end with, well, it doesn't matter what it is, but that's what the answer is. Um, but that's really all we have to do when it comes to units. It doesn't matter what you're left with. It just matters that you cancel out everything that you can. You follow your rules for algebra. All right, what about for number four? Got kind of a lot going on with that one, right? Where do we start? Start with the subtraction first. So as soon as we can recognize that, okay, well, we've got multiplication and division, but we also have the subtraction happening. That means we have to pay attention to which set of rules we're using when we have to do it in the right order. So because the subtraction is in parentheses, because it's part of a fraction, we have to do that subtraction first and do the proper rounding before we go to the next step. Once you get to, to a point where it's all multiplication or division, it doesn't matter if you round at the very end or if you round every step of the way. But every time you switch rules, you have to do your rounding. So in this case, 2.255 grams minus 2.266 grams, you get negative 0 0.11, 0 0.011 grams. And this goes to, applies to the math review as well. When when in doubt, don't try to plug it all in at once. Do one thing and leave everything else the same. Don't touch anything else yet. So leave grams and grams, leave the 100%. And what do the lines straight up and down mean? Absolute value, which means what? Negatives become positives. More, more mathematical. In, in effect, you're right. 
more mathematically, absolute value means how far is it from zero, which means it doesn't matter if it's off in the positive or the negative. Right, so negatives become positives, positives stay the way they are. So effectively, we can just do that. Do we have to do anything with our rounding though for its subtraction? Is our calculator answer good enough? Their uncertainty was to the same place already, right? Same number of decimals. So we're good there. But that means our two numbers before we did our subtraction. So I'm just going to make the point here. Before we did the subtraction, we had every number had four sig figs, right? So if you weren't paying attention, if you didn't do, do this in steps, you might think, oh, my answer is going to have four sig figs. But when we did the subtraction, we lost two sig figs. Now that means our answer is only going to have two sig figs instead of four. Right? And unless you stop and do it one step at a time, it's really hard to see why that happens. And so that's why I highly recommend taking your time with any time you have to um, mix and match your order of operations. Let's see, 0.01 divided by, you get something like. 0 0.0087. 0 0.0087. 0 0.0047. I was close. Okay. That's just doing this fraction. That's before multiplying by 100. We still have the times 100 there. What do we do with our rounding? How many? Four. Just two. This is only two sig figs. Remember, leading zeros don't count. So two sig figs divided by four sig figs means our answer has four sig figs. Sorry. I'm going to say that again. Two sig figs divided by four sig figs means our answer has two sig figs. So Point zero zero four nine times one hundred, and our units cancel out, right? We have grams over grams. This is like the example we did last Wednesday, where we said, "Well, I know I said never write something without units, but sometimes you get a number without units, especially when we're dealing with percentages." So then, our final answer is zero point four nine. Percent. It's not a sick fix. Reminder. These are not sick fix. The temptation is to call anything that's a, dem a decimal a sick fix, not the case. Anything to the left of your first non zero number. Is not a sick thing. All right. How we feel about this? Ready to do something more interesting? All right. Um, oh, and just another note here underlying numbers are considered exact. So we'll talk about how you can determine that. But we already mentioned that a little bit, right? Exact is the opposite of measure. Exact means it has infinite sig figs. There's, it's not about 100. It's 100.000 out to infinity. So in other words, an exact number will never be what limits your number of sig figs. And if you haven't necessarily had a class with me before, so you might not realize how rare it is for me to use an absolute. This is. This might be the last time you hear me use an absolute in this class. An exact number will never limit your number of sig figs. It feels, it feels dirty to say that, but never. Anyway, all right. Any questions about the math review?
and reminder on the math review, I wasn't grading for sig figs. We hadn't learned it yet. So don't worry about the rounding on the math review. But were there any parts of it that um, you wanted to go over? Was the key in working in groups enough to, to get everybody where they need to be? Okay. Um, I'm also really bad at, so there's a skill when it comes to teaching in terms of knowing how long to let the uncomfortable pause go. Um, when you ask if anybody has questions, I'm really bad at that. Um, I've been told that you're supposed to say uncomfortable pause to yourself three times before you can move on, um, but that feels like too much. So I don't usually wait that long. So when I ask for questions, it's not rhetorical, I mean it, but I might not wait that long. So seize your opportunity, please. Um, and I will do my best to make sure that I'm waiting as long as I can. All right, one more uncomfortable pause. Math review, moving on. Uh, this was that practice with the race. I did show up, it just showed up out of order, okay. All right, let's take a break and then we'll do conversions and more interesting things when we come back at two. Yeah. So I'm still with one of my kids. I just wanted to check in with you to make sure maybe yeah. you know, I'm seeing something different. So, so right now in, in that section says that there's there's 19 enrolled okay. and only three available, but there's there's five available, but for whatever reason the system takes a minute to catch up with when it, because it has to wait 24 hours before it moves to the next person on the wait list. Yeah. So yeah, we'll get you enrolled probably in the next in the next 48 hours. Yeah, okay. I just wanted um, to make sure that yeah. at the end of the week didn't roll around. I couldn't no, I, I talked to IT about trying to do that. They really fought me on trying on doing that because it would mean messing up something uh, with on the on the server side. Yeah. And so so I think we're just gonna like turn it in as soon as you get the opportunity. Yeah, okay. But it won't be late. Uh, so we'll get right, you there. Thanks. All right, cool. thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So because of the absolute value sign. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll talk about why that is in lab this week, but basically when we're talking about a percent error, mm -hmm. we don't care which direction it's off, we just care how far away it is from the other one. Mm -hmm. So we just got rid of it with the absolute value sign. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. I don't think they get upset about that. Of course, it helps if you don't 
Okay, command hand is to create pencils over here. And you were here last week, right? Are, are you on the wait list, right? Yeah, perfect. Not yet. As soon as this goes through and you're off the wait list and, and on in the official class, then you'll be fine. And it'll it'll show up in Canvas like normal. So then you can go back and fill out the you know do that quiz and everything um, and turn in the math review that way too. Thank cool. Thank you.
All right. So go ahead and bring it back here while everybody's getting back in here. Um, we're going to basically do really, really simple math um, in a way that is not so simple, um, in a way that's, that's fairly useful. Um, and that I'm going to keep coming back to is our basically our number one problem solving technique for any sort of word problems in this class is going to come back to what we're going to learn today. Um, and it's, again, the math, the basis behind this math is something that you've known since the first time you learned about a fraction. Um, but we're going to present it and write it and show our work in a slightly different way. Uh, and that's going to give us something that's known as a unit conversion. But conversions don't just get used for converting, say, meters to feet. We're going to, I'm going to show you some ways we can use these same techniques um, in a really, really powerful way um, to essentially solve almost any sort of word problem that you, that we, you might run into in this class. Um, so the, the basis of this is that anytime we can say that one amount of something, so a number in a unit, a quantity, is equal to another quantity, then that's what's called an equality, which makes sense. They're equal to each other, right? So literally, anytime you can say two things are equal to each other, that's an equality. Um, so some of the most obvious ones in terms of of units are the ones that you do sort of inherent, not inherently, uh, intuitively. So anytime you say, well, how many, how many inches are in a foot? That's an equality because what could you write? 12 inches equals one foot, All right? And so meters to centimeters, one meter equals 100 centimeters. That's an equality. But it, they can get a little bit more interesting too, because you can say things like um, one hour equals 65 miles. If you know that you're moving at a certain speed, that's true, right? If you're driving, if you've got your cruise control set at 65 miles per hour, and if you do, you best stay out of the fast lane because you're that person. Um, don't set your cruise control at 65 miles an hour on the freeway please, for all of our sakes. Um, anyway, that's still an equality. It's just a weird equality because you're not comparing two lengths to each other. You're comparing a time to a length. But you're, as long as you're going that same speed, that's still an equality, right? So anything that you can say is equal to something else is an equality. So 12 equal, inches equals one foot. What else could we write for length? What else do you know off the top of your head? Two point five four centimeters equals an inch. That's a good one. Um, that's an exact one. That is one of the, that is the only exact conversion for metric to um, British units, imperial imperial units is two point five four centimeters. And it's on your conversion sheet. You don't need to write this down. That's exact. Every other conversion from British units to metric units is approximate, which means sig figs. But this one's exact, which means infinite sig figs for both. What else is there? Uh, meters, to feet. meters to feet. What's that one off the top of your head? Three point something. Three point something. <laughs> so. That's exactly the point though, right? It's 3.3-ish. I could add more decimals if I looked them up, but I don't know it off the top of my head. So if I was actually gonna use that to do some math, I only have two sig figs on it. You've got miles involved though, right? How many, anybody know the conversion for miles? What's a mile? 5,280. And that one is exact. 
right? And we'll, again, we'll talk about how to determine exact or not um, in the future. About kilometers. Any, any exact conversions you know for kilometers? A thousand kilometers is a meter, is that one right? That's not, it's the other way. But the reason that I, that I reset that is because that's a, an, a really good example of one of the most common mistakes with these equalities, especially when we get into, sorry, prefixes is further along than I thought. Um, prefixes is when you mix up whether it makes something bigger or smaller. So in your head, everybody knows at least roughly that a kilometer is a big distance, right? At least compared to a meter. And everybody knows that a meter is you know, something you measure a person's height in, right? So a kilometer should be a lot of meters, not the other way around. On the other hand, a millimeter is something that you use to measure the width of a guitar string, not a person's height, right? So a millimeter is a lot smaller than a meter. So when we're writing some of these conversions, it can be helpful to make sure you don't make that really I don't want to say it's a dumb mistake because it's an easy mistake to make, but it's a mistake that if you get marked down on, you're going to be kicking yourself because it's one of those, I know better than that mistakes. So think about it when you're writing these, that does what I just wrote make sense? Does it make sense to say a thousand kilometers is one meter? No. And, and we'll get more practice with that. Um, yeah, you could do a thousand meters is one kilometer. And again, it's not an exact conversion, but you could say something like 1.6 kilometers is one mile. But if you wanted more sig figs, you would have to measure it better. There's lots of different equalities we can write. In fact, we can even do things like, um, we can combine these, right? If we say that one mile is 1.6 kilometers, and we can also say one mile is 5,280 feet. We can, anytime we say one thing is equal to some, if A is equal to B and B is equal to C, what do you know about A and C? They're, they must also be equal, right? So that means we can actually write these as an equality too. 1.6 kilometers equals 5,280 feet. Right? There's no limit to the way we can combine these. As long as you can say two things are equal to each other, you can write equality. We can write equalities for volume. Like two pints is a quart. Four quarts is equal to one gallon. One gallon is equal to... 3.85 liters, maybe the other way around. I'll, I always remember that a gallon is really close to four liters, but it's not exactly the same. And I always guess which way it's off and I'm always wrong. So within one sig fig, a gallon is four liters, right? That's an equality. What equality could we write for a year for time? Three hundred and sixty-five would be to three sig figs. Three hundred and sixty-five and a quarter would be four sig figs. But really, it's actually three hundred and sixty-five point two four days is one year. That's really close to a quarter, right? Which is why every four years we're off by a day. If you just assume a year is 365 days, every four years we get one extra day, leap day. But it also means with that system, we're off by 0.01 every 100 years, which is why every 100 years you don't get a leap day. So on 2000, the year 2000 should have been a leap year based on the every four years. But it wasn't a leap year because it was the year 2000 in the year 1900. In the year 1800 also didn't have leap year leap days because of the uncertainty in the hundreds place there. So the five sig figs though that's a that's a good conversion. 365.24 days is a year. More sig figs than you need under most circumstances though, right? 
So all this just to show that anytime you can say, you know, two things are the same, even if they have different units, you can say that they're equal to each other. Well, if I'm not making you memorize conversions, then what really is the point of all this? If we're going back to, let me pull back, go back to, oh, and this is the practice test, so it should even have the conversion sheet on it. If I'm giving you this conversion sheet permanently anyway, why does it matter? Well, because sometimes you're going to see things that aren't on the conversion sheet or where you want where there's an equality that's not true all the time, but it's true for this system. Like I'm driving 65 miles an hour. I can't always say one hour equals 65 miles unless I set my cruise control, right? Unless it's, I'm saying for this system. But like I said, I'm not gonna take these away from you. So you'll always have this to work from. And the prefixes too, and they're shown in kind of a weird way. And we'll talk about how to use this, but if, essentially this is everything you need to use the metric system. This is all you really need for the metric system, which is one of the reasons why it's so valuable. Is you know these prefixes and roughly what those multipliers are, that has everything you need to write a huge variety of unit convert or unit equalities, right? Kilo means 10 to the three. Does it mean bigger or smaller? Well, that's where paying attention to it comes into play, right? A kilometer is bigger than a meter. How much bigger? It's 10 to the three times bigger. Right, so this has all of those conversions built into it for kilometers, for milligrams, for you can do things, you know, nanoseconds. You want to know what a nanosecond is? Well, a second is an amount of time, and a nanosecond has this 10 to the minus 9 multiplied. In other words, a nanosecond is smaller than a second. And how much smaller? 10 to the 9 times. So we can write a conversion that says 10 to the, or an equality, that says 10 to the 9 nanoseconds equals 1 second. And so it takes a little bit of practice with the negative exponents to pay attention to how this works, but it really is always going to come back to, is this something that makes it smaller or something that makes it bigger? It's going to tell you where the number goes. Preston? Why isn't it kind of negative? Because a nanosecond is smaller than a second. So there's the other way we can write this is 10 to the minus nine seconds is one nanosecond. Most people don't like dealing with negative exponents if we can avoid it, right? Intuitively, it makes more sense to say there's a lot of nanoseconds in one second than it does to say it's a really, really small portion of a second that means one nanosecond. Most people, at least maybe this is just my bias because I'm the one teaching them. Um, to me, this one makes more sense. So I tend to think about it this way. This is just as correct of an equality though. And the way that I always remember it with these is, well, if I can just remember which ones make things small and which ones make things big, then I just need to make sure that my equality makes sense when I write it out. I don't need to remember that giga means, you know, that as long as that giga makes things bigger, that means one gigameter is a lot of meters. So then when I write my equality out, I just make sure that I write it properly. Okay, a lot of meters, 10 to the nine meters equals one gigameter. And so, and the, the only, there is a more explicit way of writing these out. I've not found one that's this compact and universal. The reason that I don't just give you one that has every way of writing it both directions is because that's not what's going to be given if you take a standardized test that has math and these units on it. Right, so I'm trying to give you the bare minimum for what you need. If you know what you're doing, this should be enough, but it does take a little practice to be able to use it. Um, quick note about 
there are a number of things that I'm going to be very picky about. And I will explain why I'm very picky about them. But one of them is capitalization, especially on units. You have to be careful with units because we're going to use a lot of different units from different places, different derivations. Um, so we have to be very careful that you don't write um, just if you write, if you mean minutes, you don't write MI. It's MI doesn't mean minutes. MI means miles, right? So we can be picky with my unit abbreviations because you need to be clear with what your units mean, right? So lowercase m as a unit means meters. Lowercase m as a prefix, meaning if you put it on the front of a unit, means milli. Capital M as a unit is a concentration unit in chemistry, it means moles per liter. Capital M as a prefix means mega. Right, so I'm going to be very picky with capitalization because it's really easy to confuse yourself if you're not paying attention to it. Right? And so the more you pay attention to your capitalization and make sure you only use the right units, don't, don't get lazy and instead of writing M-I-N for minutes, don't write M for minutes because when you come back and look at your notes, you're going to think that that meant meters. And why am I writing one meter is equal to 60 seconds, right? It's really easy to confuse yourself and everybody else. So be careful with that. All right. So we have that list of equalities. Cool, we can write an equality. It just means two things are equal. Why does it matter? Because we can do some simple algebra with it. If we have a, an equality, we can do algebra. We say, okay, well, I'm gonna divide both sides by one side. I'm gonna divide both sides by one meter. Okay, cool, now I have a 100 centimeters over one meter on the right-hand side. What does the left-hand side become? Not zero, close, you were headed the right way, one. Right, the meters cancel out meters and you just get one. And let me phrase this in a way, I'm gonna phrase it as a leading question. Why was one the easiest multiplication table to memorize as a kid? Nothing changes. You multiply by one and everything stays the same, right? Well, we just took our equality and we turned it into something that's equal to one. So it means we can multiply anything we want with this factor without changing the number we started with. We might change what it looks like, but numerically, but we didn't change how much it is. So basically all of converting units is all we're learning is multiplying by one. We're just doing it in a weird way that looks like a fraction and then canceling units out. So here's our key. No matter what number we have, we can always multiply by one without changing the number. If we can multiply by one, we can also multiply by anything equal to one, like a conversion factor. So anytime you have an equality, we can turn it into a conversion factor that's equal to one. And if we have the same units on top and bottom of a fraction, they cancel out. So we saw that a second ago or half hour ago when we did those review problems, right? When we had leaders, when we multiplied across and we had leaders on top and leaders on bottom, so we canceled them out. That's all unit conversions are is basically set it up so that the units you don't want anymore cancel each other out and you're left in the units you do want. So if we wanted to do a conversion, say 0.571 meters into centimeters, that's really easy, right? If you've ever had a science class before, you probably think I can do that in my head. What's, what do you need to do mathematically? If you're plugging this into your calculator, what would you do? Or do you even need to plug it into your calculator? Times by 100, right? Why does that work? 
because we want meters to cancel out meters and we want centimeters to be what we're left with, right? If we want to know how many centimeters it is, but we're in meters, we need to set it up so that we're going to multiply by one in a way that lets meters cancel out with meters. And so you guys know what to do intuitively to plug this into your calculator to get the right answer. I would encourage you to show your work on the really easy ones because we'll get to some where it's not obvious what steps you need to do. And showing your work like this will be what keeps you from multiplying by 100 when you were supposed to divide by 100. So a conversion factor is just an equality where it's a fraction where the top is equal to the bottom, right? So we got rid of the equal sign, basically. So we can say, okay, well, one meter is equal to 100 centimeters. And now when we do, when we look at this as a fraction, meters is on top and meters is on bottom. Cancel out. The only units left now are centimeters, right? All we have to do is multiply across, do any division that we need to do as well. We have something that's on the bottom, and we get our answer 57.1 centimeters. Really easy math for right now, right? The process is what I want you to be paying attention to. And it's always the same process. Take the unit that you don't want anymore and you put it on the bottom of your conversion factor so it'll cancel out. And what should go on the top of your conversion factor is the unit you do want to end it. And so now all of a sudden you can see how being able to write our own conversion factors becomes really powerful, right? Any, we can make any combination we want out of these as long as we can say that the top is equal to the bottom. Oh. So again, here's one that you know how to do in your head intuitively. If I say 5.33 feet how many into inches, you know what to do with that mathematically, right? What are you gonna plug into your calculator? What was it? Times 12. Yeah, 5.33 times 12. You know how to do this. To paraphrase my old Eastern European grad school teacher, you have known this kindergarten, Polish guy, giant Polish man who always made us feel inadequate by telling us we should have learned our integrals in kindergarten. Um, but in this case, it's not that far from it, right? If you want to go feet to inches, you multiply by 12. Show your work and you'll see why that happens. I point three three feet. I want to cancel out feet and be left in inches. So I need a conversion factor that's got feet on bottom and inches on top. And we need the top to be equal to the bottom. So one foot is equal to 12 inches. When we multiply across, feet cancels feet. 5.33 times 12. All of it divided by one. We don't need to plug that into our calculator, but it's worth remembering because sometimes our conversion factor will have a number on bottom. So this is just showing the work for why you go when you go feet to inches and multiply by 12. We get 64.0. What do we do for sig figs? It's all multiplication, right? So keep the least number of sig figs. What has the least number of sig figs? I got you a trick question again. Not trying to trick you on this, but I'm making sure that we're paying attention. Is it about 12 inches in a foot? It's exact, right? No matter what, you, it's 12.00 out to infinity inches in a foot. It's the definition of a foot is 12 inches. 
So with that in mind, this is has infinite sig figs, and so does this one. So three sig figs for our answer, 64.0. Right, so anytime you get a conversion factor that's exact, or you say it's a, where it's a definition, and that's gonna be mostly when you're converting in the same system, meaning British units to British units or metric units to metric units, those are almost always exact conversions. It's not about a thousand meters in a kilometer, it's exactly a thousand meters in a kilometer. In fact, the definition of a kilometer is a thousand meters. So if you can sit using only exact conversions, you're just going to get the same number of sig figs out that you put into it. Or you always want to double check that and think about it. Yeah. Exactly. As long as your conversion factor is exact, you can just ignore it because it's never going to be what limits your sig figs. Is there any limit to how many times we could multiply by one without changing the number? This all worked because we multiplied by one, right? This is just a fancy way of writing one. So we could do it again if we wanted. So we can actually set these up and just you know, they look like a long math problem, and there's a lot of things to punch into a calculator, but you're just multiply by one, multiply by one, multiply by one, and you cancel out units every time. So if we wanted to go from inches to miles, again, you could probably, if you've got a head for, for math, if you've been practicing your math, you can probably figure out what to plug in into your calculator without showing your work. Maybe a good idea to practice this. What steps would we have to do? We could go from inches to feet. We just did the opposite, right? So if we can go from feet to inches, we can go inches to feet. And then once we're in feet, what do we do? Feet to miles. Right, and so this is what I call a, a roadmap. Sometimes even without putting any numbers in, just so you don't forget what you're doing or, or so you have an idea of what's going on. You can say, okay, well, if I'm in inches, inches to feet, feet to miles. And then you can fill it in with the numbers. Again, this, this is a pretty short one, but sometimes you'll have multiple steps. Um, and having sort of an idea of where you're trying to go will remind you what conversions you need to use to get there. So 5.33, 10 to the six inches. If I want to convert that to feet, we can go, we can go inches to feet, right? We just need to set it up so that inches cancels out inches. So what do we do? One foot over 12 inches. And a lot of times I wind up writing these backwards. I write from the bottom up with the conversion factors. So it's like inches, put inches there, then write the top. You can stop, you can plug that into your calculator, get an answer in feet right there. 5.33 times 10 to the six divided by 12. Just remember how multiplying fractions across works, right? Multiply everything on the top across, multiply everything on the bottom across, and then take the top divided by the bottom. Or if you just plug in this into your calculator, you can just say this divided by 12. If it's on the bottom, if you're going to divide by it. If it's on the top, you're multiplying by it. So if inches cancels inches, we're left in feet. which will get something times 10 to the four, B times 10 to the four. Anybody plug it in? I got 444,166. Give me how many sig figs are we gonna to wanna to keep out of this? Three, Three right? Exact three six six so four point four 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 point four four 
said 444,000. So I just looked at the decimal when I was doing that dividing in my head. It said 10 to the four is 10 to the five. And now we're in feet, right? So we can do the same thing where we have a conversion for feet to miles, we're home free. So I'm gonna rewrite it over here. It doesn't really matter where you write it. 4.44, 10 to the five feet. And if you don't have it memorized, go to your conversion sheet that everybody listened to me and planned ahead and printed out for themselves at home last week, right? Everybody has that conversion sheet? That was, that was a joke, I know. None of you went home, rushed home to print out your periodic table and your equation sheet. Um, if you don't have it, ask me for a copy. I'll print it for you in lab. 5,280 feet is one mile. And that is exact again. Now, feet on top, feet on bottom. We'll be left in miles. We'll be in something in the hundreds range. 90 miles, maybe? 84? If all we're doing with these conversions is multiplying by one, is there any reason why we had to stop and hit enter on our calculator right here? Or we could just keep multiplying by one, right? By one, by which I mean another conversion factor. You don't have to stop, write down your answer, set up another conversion. When you get comfortable with this, the fastest way to do this is to set multiple conversions up in a row. Then you only have to plug it into your calculator once. We already canceled out inches and now we're in feet. So we just want to set it up so the feet cancels feet again. Mathematically, it'll give you the exact same thing we just did in two steps. It's shown in one line of steps instead of two. If you stop to round every step of the way and it's a long, conversion problem, or if it happens to be you rounded 0.4 down three times in a row versus you waited to the very end to round, sometimes you'll be off by one in that last digit. That's what uncertainty is for. That's why we have these rules for determining how many, how many digits we get to keep, is you should be off by at most a tenth of a mile in your final answer, at most one spot in your last reported sig fig. It doesn't matter whether you stop to round every step or if you wait till the very end to round, as long as you're not switching operations in the middle. Did I see a hand a second ago? All right. You can also see how steps that individually you might have known instinctively, intuitively, oh, I'm supposed to multiply by 12 or I'm supposed to divide by 5,280. Showing your work makes it really, really clear what you're supposed to do, whether you're supposed to multiply or divide, right? So even if it's a conversion that you know how to do in your head and you could plug into your calculator, it's a really good idea to set it up to make sure you're not saying something dumb like 12 feet equals one inch. Again, I shouldn't call it dumb. It's a really easy mistake to make, but showing your work like this and make your units cancel out is going to keep you from making those those mistakes where you're kicking yourself down the road. All right, so this is getting into looking at um, prefixes and how we use those prefixes. There's some cool stuff here though. Um, why would we need those SI unit prefixes? The milli versus the kilo. Why not just do everything in meters? I mean, why not just pick one and go with it, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's because it takes a lot to be able to process that in your head. Our brain doesn't work well at handling numbers between about outside of a pretty narrow range from about 0.1 to 10. Our brain doesn't do numbers well. Not, and that's something you can get around. We can train ourselves to try and be able to think. Um, but if I said that, if I said my house was 20,000 feet from here, What's the first thing you do to try and visualize that? You put it in miles, right? Our brain instinctively tries to keep units between about 0.1 to 10. And really, if I said, if I said, uh, you know, 0.5 of something, what does your brain do to visualize? If I said, what's 0.5 of the distance of this table? It's half, right? The only reason our brain can even handle going to point from point one to one is because we think in fractions instinctively. So if I say 0.25, you say, oh, it's a quarter, right? So one of the reasons why we have all these different units is just limitation of the way our brains work. We need to be able to put it in units that make sense to us to some extent, or else we can't really do math in our head very well. We can't visualize what these numbers look like. You really want to mess with your brain. Next time, so your brain really only thinks from about a third to three. It doesn't even go above three. You see a group of things. You're, if you try to actually say how many objects are in that group, your brain instinctively breaks it up into groups of two or three and then adds them at the end. You can't actually look at a group of five people and see five people. You see a group of three people and a group of two people. Pay attention to the way that your brain counts things and you'll actually notice that. And now you won't be able to unnotice that. And that's my gift to you. You'll forever be thinking about that now. Um, but that's one of the reasons we want units. We need to get into that realm or it doesn't make any sense. And the universe is really, really big and also really, really small. So this is just a fun little Java applet that's called the scale of the universe. Somebody went through and, and programmed this with a, a, you know, a bunch of things that we have some physical intuition for. And then every one of these circles is either a factor of 10 or a, fact, a factor of 10 times larger or smaller. I forgot it does have nice dramatic music as well. Um, and some of these are kind of actually, this is a good way to, to kill some time. Just you know a giant earthworm is about three meters long, um, which is a little, a little bit weird. Um, and if you want real nightmare fuel, Japanese spider crabs can be about three meters across. Um, and they didn't have to call it a spider crab, but they did. And now I'm thinking about a 10 foot spider. Um, but you can zoom way in and see all these different things. So here's a millimeter. So that's a thousand times smaller than a meter and we're into the realm of dust mites and grains of salt. And you can keep going and keep going and keep going. So the smallest thing visible to an optical microscope is a little bit smaller than a micrometer. Bacteriophage, right? So we need units for all these things if we wanna be able to do science with all these things, we wanna understand these scales. So what do we do? Rather than memorize a bunch of random numbers like 5,280, we have a list of prefixes that we can apply to anything. And they, for the most part, go by powers of a thousand. Like giga is 10 to the three times larger than mega, which is 10 to the three times larger than kilo, which is 10 to the three times larger than no prefix. Right, so they go by these powers of 1000 basically. So they mimic what we do when we write things, right? We group things by thousands, millions, um, billions, etc. Groups of three. Right, and now we're finally getting into chemicals, right? We had to get all the way down into the nanometers region. And if you go all the way the other direction, I hope nobody gets vertigo. Um, we start seeing like West Virginia 
small, some of the smaller dwarf planets in our solar system. Grand Canyon, lots of planets. A Minecraft world, it's actually 64,000 kilometers, apparently. Um, I don't know that anybody has ever actually reached the edge of one of those, but I wouldn't put it past a YouTuber. And we get into stars, right? So we need to be able to describe everything from a terameter, 10 to the 12 meters, all the way down to a nanometer, depending on what field of science we're talking about on any given day. So it's helpful to have these prefixes and just know that they go by these powers of um, 10 to the three. And there are some that kind of fill in the region that aren't 10 to the three, but they, they're sort of the specialized. Other than centi and deci, everything else is gonna be powers of 10 to the three. And so I don't have this memorized, but I do remember that the order that they go in until you get out to the extremes. And then I just remember they go by powers of 10 to the three. So I just count that way. How do you know how many zeros to write if I tell you to write a billion? You count in groups of three, right? Oh, that's my millions, that's my thousands, that's my hundreds, et cetera, right? It works the same exact way. And that means there's a whole bunch of conversions we can write with those. All right, and typically it's not the way our brain really likes to think, but keep it under a thousand is, is adequate your brain then turns it into groups of a hundred um, to estimate things, but it's not a bad way of, um, of being able to estimate things. Right? And so, and again, some of these prefixes are making the unit smaller and some of them are making the unit bigger. In this, the scientific notation set, um, side, it always gets written like this, but you kind of have to remember the positive versus the negative is really, there's not a lot of consistency between textbooks, whether you put the negative on one side versus the other. You, like I showed before, you can write it two different ways and still have it be correct, right? And so it really is a matter of making it make sense. I know these prefixes make things bigger, therefore it takes a lot of meters to make a kilometer. It's going to come back to, is it reasonable? Did I just write something that makes sense or not? Uh, and so if you want practice, there's some practice here. You could write, okay, one second is equal to how many teraseconds? That's not a unit that sounds very familiar to us, but there's no reason that we can't have a terasecond. Well, a tera is... 10 to the 12. So tera is a, is a prefix that makes things big, like a terabyte is a lot bigger than one byte, right? In terms of computer science. So a tera second should be a lot bigger than one second. So we can either say 10 to the 12 seconds is equal to one capital T lowercase s. Oh, you remember the number there. 10 to the 12 seconds is one terasecond, or one second is how many? If I wanted to write it like this, that would be 10 to the negative 12. So, in other words, sorry. If you take one terasecond, you say 0 0.000110s and then put a one, that's one second. So, so a lot of times, just like we use commas to indicate that we've got thousands to separate thousands from millions from millions from those big numbers. Um, a lot of times what you'll see is a space for small numbers, but that's kind of, that's really hard to show when you're in handwriting, especially when your handwriting looks like mine. So I'll usually use an underscore to indicate the groups of three separate these for counting. 
point zero 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 one teraseconds is one second. This way makes more sense to me though, because then we're not dealing with numbers less than one. And reminder, I this is just what we, we just went over. There's two ways to write all of these. Just make sense, make sure that it makes sense. Um, there's a list of prefixes to make things smaller. This will be where we spend most of our time in this class because chemicals are very small. We don't deal a whole lot with you know gigameters in this class. We'll deal a lot with nanometers though. A lot, putting it strongly. Um, and there is even a limit. You get to a certain point and you, there's still debate going about what's called the Planck length and the Planck time, which are basically like the pixelation of the universe. You get to small enough scales and it behaves like pixels in a screen where you can't have a distance that's smaller than one Planck length. Um, but that's, I wanna say that that's like 10 to the minus 34 meters. But basically atoms individually are in the pico picometer range. So we don't need to get that much smaller than picometers for normal purposes, unless we're getting into theoretical physics. All right, so there's some practice with some more of these prefixes. Um, if we wanna do that, let me see what's on the... So we'll do these and then we'll start class with a bunch of practice doing conversions on on uh, Wednesday. So if we have a thousand meters, what is the right prefix to use for that? 1000 meters equals one kilometer, km, lowercase k. And what's the other way of writing that? So we can say 1000 meters equals one kilometer, or we can say what? One meter equals just as true, but gross decimal. <laughs> Ten to the minus three grams is what is one milligram. Factors of three, right? The first factor of three when we're making things smaller is milli. One milligram is 10 to the minus three grams or 10 to the three milligrams is one gram. And last, I'm not even sure if I should say it, but certainly not least, because it's probably the easiest one up there. 0.01 meters is one centimeter. One of our few that's not a power of 10 or a power of 10 to the three. So 0 0.01 centimeter or meter equals one centimeter or 100 centimeters equals one meter. If you're ever sure about going back and forth between the two of these, just remember it's just algebra. If I want to go from this version to that version, I just need to divide both sides by 0 0.001. You divide both sides by 0 0.001, this cancels out, and one divided by 0 0.001 is a thousand. And so it's all it is is algebra. All I told you all we're doing today is really, really simple algebra dressed up to look complicated. Right? That's all conversions are. Have a good one. If I don't see you for lab today, if I do see you for lab today, um, then drive safe on the way home later. <laughs>